Bienvenidos, welcome. I am Mirna Perez. Uh, for those of us that don't uh, know who the Brennan Center is, we are a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit uh, law and policy institute uh, affiliated at NYU School of Law. We're named after the great Justice William Brennan, who made famous the idea of a living constitution. And he um, very much believed that the constitution didn't have words that were static, but rather needed to be dynamic so that they would meet the, the challenges of the moment. And that's the way we approach um, our work. Um, I uh, love that I do a lot of work in Texas, but I am really, really tired of having to sue my state and really, really wish um, that Texas would get with at least the middle of the rest of the country in terms of voter access, because I think it is one of the most closed and restrictive states. Um, I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but they gave me a large block of time. And during that time, I wanna cover at least three topics because this was a really, really big week for voting rights. There were things that um, you know we had been gearing up for for months that kind of all hit at the same time. Um, so just so you know what they are, uh, the first I'm going to talk about the Brnovich case, the second I'm going to talk about HR1, and then third I'm going to talk about the legislative sessions around the country. So Brnovich, um, it is a case that came out of Arizona. Uh, Arizona had two policies that were challenged. One policy uh, required a election official to discard the entirety of a ballot if a person voted in the wrong precinct. So if a person you know, voted at, in Maricopa County when they should have voted in Tucson, even their statewide races, even their race, even their ballot for president wouldn't have gotten counted. Um, so that is a policy that was compounded because they were moving polling locations a whole lot in communities of color. So people would go to the wrong polling place, not know it, and instead of the poll workers telling them where to go, they'd vote their ballot that would then not get counted um, because they were not in the right place. A lot of states reject ballots partially, but not very many states reject the entirety of the ballot. And that's what made this particularly onerous, especially when it was sandwiched on top of the fact that they were moving ballot, uh, moving polling locations all the time. The second policy was one that criminalized anybody who wasn't an immediate family member from helping you collect uh, or fill out your, your mail ballot. Um, sometimes people call that ballot harvesting, but at the Brennan Center, we think it's ballot collection and ballot assistance. And it's really, really important to certain communities, especially in Arizona, the Native American community um, really relies on um, ballot assisters um, because we have not been doing right by the Native community and they don't have enough early voting sites and they don't have enough precincts within their, um, within their tribal lands. And so this was a way of you know, somebody deciding that they were gonna drive 20 miles into the post office could just take like the whole uh, neighborhoods ballots. So they uh, they were those two ballots. Those two policies were challenged by the the DNC, which was a bit unfortunate because that that politicized the issue a lot more than it needed to be. Um, but it was challenged by the DNC. They lost at the district court level, and the Ninth Circuit on Bonk uh, overturned the district court and decided that both of those policies violated. Uh, a provision of the Voting Rights Act, which provides nationwide protections against policies that abridge or deny a community of color's opportunity to elect their candidates of choice. Um, and not only did the Ninth Circuit en banc decide that this law violated uh, that policy, like that, that violated that law, violated um, the or interfered with the ability of communities of color to elect their candidates of choice with respect to the uh the ballot collection prohibition the ninth circuit found that that was done purposely to impede or interfere it was what we lawyers call intent it had an intent to discriminate which is different than just an effect to discriminate or the effect of discriminating so 
you know, this should have been a, a clear cut case for the Supreme Court, right? They would either decide that the policies in Arizona violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act or they wouldn't. But then the Attorney General of Arizona, the Republican Party of Arizona, and a whole host of amici, including Texas Senator Ted Cruz, uh, petitioned the court for outrageous and harmful readings of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. They were arguing that Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act should only cover redistricting, for example. So the lawsuit uh, me and my colleagues filed against Texas's really strict photo ID law, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, uh, that some of them argued that you could only uh, violate Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act or the court should interpret Section 2 as only being uh, viable if you could prove discriminatory intent. And it's really, really hard to prove discriminatory intent. Now, in this case, they had for one of the provisions, but if that became the nationwide standard, so much discrimination would go unchecked because people are usually smart, smarter these days about not saying the quiet part out loud. Um, uh, there were folks that were asking for uh, the standard by which courts should interpret Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act would be next to impossible to meet. So it was this giant encouragement of anti-voter forces telling the court, um, we want the court to uh, make it really hard or make it much harder to be able to challenge laws that discriminate against communities of color. So the argument happened and it was a pretty ho-hum argument, uh, but the part that I want everybody to know is that Justice Comey Barrett asked uh, the Republican party lawyer, what is your interest in this case? Like, why are you so intent on maintaining the out of precinct policy? And he said, and I don't, you will get the transcript, you know, exactly, but he basically said that politics is a zero sum game and that the Republicans would be at a competitive disadvantage vis a vis Democrats if they got rid of the policy. And I have to tell you, that is outrageous. It is outrageous that in this, that somebody would say aloud that the reason they want a policy is because it makes it harder for some people to vote and it makes it harder for their competitors, the voters from their competing party to vote. Um, my hope is that alone ensures some sort of victory and some, some sort of protection. But what I think is telling is not only do some people believe that, but they're not even embarrassed about it anymore. They're not even, like we keep saying, it's talk about the quiet part out loud. Um, we all knew that that was why they were opposed to it, but they just admitted it in open court, um, to the Supreme Court no less in response to questioning. So that's a case you wanna watch. That's a case that will matter a lot for Texas because Texas is very frequently sued under section two of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that we will get a ruling that uh, even if it doesn't strike down these two Arizona policies that will keep section two intact and in whole because we really, really need it now. So that's issue number one that was really big and that was Tuesday. The second big thing that happened is in the middle of the week, in the hours uh, late into the night, uh, the House of Representatives passed HR1 or the For the People Act. It's called HR1 because it's House Resolution 1. Of all the things that are vexing our country right now, Congress said that the first thing we need to take up, the first thing that we need to do is democracy. And HR1 is a comprehensive mammoth bill. It is more than 800 pages, more than 700 pages. Um, it covers a lot of areas, including online voter registration, automatic voter registration, same day voter registration, vote by mail. Um, it standardizes security for poll books. It uh, includes early voting. It has a redistricting component. It has an ethics component. It has uh, components getting money out of politics. Um, it really does quite a number of things. And what is really extraordinary about HR1 is that it examines what has gone wrong in the last 10 years in our elections and finds a solution that it derived from one of the states. It takes the best practices from the states and puts it all in one bill. It is comprehensive, it is transformative, um, and it passed one of the House. Now, 
There are a couple of things that I really want to lift up. Um, one thing that HR1 does is it makes a commitment to pass uh, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, or the Voting Rights Act, it makes a commitment to restore it. The other thing that it does is it uh, makes sure that, uh, that people with voters with disabilities will have access. It has uh, provisions protecting communities of color and others against deceptive practices and intimidation. It restores voting rights to people with criminal convictions in their past if they're living in the community and for federal elections. So it has two like kind of modes. There's one mode where it's straight up election administration. And then there's one mode where it takes on these issues that have been really harmful to communities of color. Um, now, we all know that when something goes wrong on election day, those communities that are most on the margins, by definition, are gonna have the hardest time overcoming it because they are the ones on the margins. Their margins are so thin that when something goes wrong, uh, they end up uh, being in a bad spot. If I go and show up on my polling place and discover that I was purged, I'm not going to get fired if I spend all day running around trying to figure out what happened and making sure that I'm able to get my provisional ballot counted because I went to the canvassing board. If you work hourly, if you are dependent on public transportation, if you uh, need childcare assistance, if somebody else is uh, giving you a ride, these are all reasons why an election snafu, an election failing um, is going to hurt communities of color. Now, it is not a straight up anti-discrimination bill. That is another provision. That is uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. That particular bill would restore the strength of the Voting Rights Act after it was weakened in 2013 in a Supreme Court decision called Shelby County versus Holder. So one of the things that progressives need to do is to remind Congress that their work is not done just because they passed HR 1. HR 1 deals with the election administration issues, which will help communities of color, but the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is actually an anti-discrimination bill. It is a tangible representation of the promise that we make to Americans that when they step into the ballot box, they will be free from racial discrimination. And we need to say that to the country as loudly as we can that those are our values. It is our values that we have free, fair, and accessible elections, and we passed a law to make that be so. And we cannot uh, let Congress have a very short attention span. And just because um, if they end up passing HR 1, then let them forget that they still have to go and pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. They should be thought of as two different um, necessary components that need each other and that both need to happen this legislative session. Um, and then the final thing I want to talk about is something that Texans certainly know. We have state legislatures all over the country, you know, engaging in shenanigans or being poised to engage in shenanigans. Um, we did an analysis of every piece of state legislation that had been introduced across the country and found that more than 43 states had passed, uh, had introduced more than 250 bills that would make it harder to vote. We have not seen anything of the likes of this. The closest we've seen in recent history um, happened in 2010, or happened in, right after 2010, after all the state houses changed. And from that wave, we saw 19 states pass bills that would make it harder for people to vote. So we cannot be asleep. Like We have to have our eyes wide open. We have to be ready for the fight. We need to be going to our, the legislature and, and being ready to push back on these bills. So. As I, I'm sure that Josh will tell you, there's hearings on Monday, um, you know, to start. Um, there have been hearings all week in Georgia. Uh, there have been he uh, hearings and bills being passed out of Iowa. I mean, everywhere there is a, you know, a live legislative firefight. And one of the things that I'm hoping will happen is that uh, every single person who is watching this will reach out to their state legislature and legislator and tell them, I am a voter that votes on voting issues. And if you do not cast votes in favor of voters, if you do not cast vote in favor of a free, fair and accessible election, then you will not get my vote. Um, we're all better off when all of us are voting. 
We are all better off when our neighbors, even if they don't agree with us, are able to have a free, fair, and accessible ballot. Um, and we are all better off when our democracy works for everybody. And right now, especially in places like Texas, which is undergoing so much demographic change, especially in a place like Georgia, which is experiencing something similar, you know, we are seeing politicians that would rather manipulate the legislative process to give themselves a job security plan than actually compete for voters. And that's exactly backwards. <laughs> that is exactly backwards. We should have uh, voters choosing the politicians, not politicians getting to choose who decides to vote. Um, and for that reason, I'm hoping that folks will get engaged. I'm hoping that you guys will look to Texas Impact about how you guys should be feeling on certain bills. The Brennan Center is certainly going to have, uh, you know, we're certainly going to put in our opposition slip on Monday. We've uh, fortunately got folks on the ground there that are going to be um, working on um, working on our behalf. Um, and we need to be saying every day, all the time. That we care about our democracy and we care about uh, about being able to vote freely and that we are not going to tolerate these kinds of um, messing around with our vote. It's not the vote and the electoral process does not exist for the politicians. They exist for us. And when it is corrupted, when it is tarnished, when it is bedraggled, then we don't get our say and that all of the issues that matter to us, whether your jam be the environment or LGBTQ rights or anti-hunger initiatives, nothing you care about, I'm gonna repeat this again, nothing you care about is gonna get done unless all of us have a free and fair vote. So I'm hoping you will join with Texas Impact. I'm hoping you will join with the Brennan Center and um, we'll, we'll do our best to stop, to stop these wave of bad bills in Texas. And the fight starts now. So roll up your sleeves and be ready to go on Monday. Thanks, Myrna. Uh, so our legislature <laughs> just got started. It, well, I mean, it didn't, it didn't. I mean, it's 140 days once every two years. If we can uh, get through the 140 days, then uh, barring a special session, we're good for a couple, couple of years. Yep. Where we're at in it is the first 60 days which is reserved for bill filing. So I was telling uh, everybody else uh, in a previous session that where we're at is there's been about 2,500 bills filed roughly in the house. We expect there to be uh, on average at least 2,000 more that drop in the next uh, less than two weeks before the bill filing deadline. There's always a deluge at the very end that, that happens. So, uh, we still have 2,000, probably uh, kind of just on the House side to go. Uh, committees are just getting started here in Texas. Um, the uh, House Elections Committee just had its first organizational hearing, which is kind of how they get their committee mm -hmm. started. And uh, they're going to start hearing bills next week, although the, 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 bigger, the bigger dockets, for lack of a better term, bigger agendas uh, will come in a couple of weeks ahead. I say all that to say the full penalty of bad uh, has not yet been revealed to us here. In right. this. I don't, we don't, we can't. Yeah, but we know, we know some things though, right, Josh? Like we know that they're trying to over-criminalize people who make mistakes. We know that they're trying to make it impossible for people to have automatic voter registration or online registration. We know that they're trying to do more aggressive purges. We know that they're trying to empower poll workers to, to discriminate and take pictures of people when they think that their IDs aren't working. Um, so, you know, I, I know that the, the parade of horribles is still, uh, you know, is still not yet revealed itself in all of its glory, but um, we know we're in the middle, we know we're in the middle of a fight. Like we know that we've got to be ready for this fight. And I know that y'all know that. Um, and I think the big challenge for groups like Texas Impact in a state like Texas is, you know, what are the bills you can change? What are the bills you can kill? And what is the best way to lose when you're going to lose, right? And so um, one of the things that I, I always tell um, people of conscience is that I need a record when I'm going to come in and sue somebody. Like, I need to be able to say, look, these, Congre these legislators were warned. They were warned in witness testimony about how this was going to be harmful to people. And they did it anyway. 
right? Like, you know, having somebody go up and say, you know, this policy is going to make it impossible for me to vote because here's who I am. And or this policy is going to, you know, make it impossible for my mother to vote. Like when when the politicians know that there's going to be like real damage and they do it anyway, not only is that something that I can use in court, it's also something that we can use to get public attention to it. One of the things that I think was, notwithstanding the fact that we lost this Dropbox test, not, I mean, the testimony that, that your board member gave, like was just so powerful. I, I wish, I wish this could, it could have been public and we could have shared it. But uh, one of the things that we did really well was we nationalized a Texas problem. Right, just like we did in Georgia. These drop boxes, like everybody in the country was talking about the ridiculousness of saying that Harris County couldn't have any more drop boxes than dime box Texas. Like everybody knew how ridiculous that was. And when we have good stories and good witnesses and, and really compelling examples being told to the legislature, I can use it in a court, we can use it in the media, um, and we can nationalize this issue so that you guys get more ground troops for the fight. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful to know. One of the things that scares me is they're not doing virtual testimony in Texas. You have to actually physically go to the, the committee room. Uh, yep. so, I mean, so if, if and when we start to get vaccinated, we're, we're going to have to march on in there and and uh, create a record for you. Um, yeah, no, and it's funny because somebody in the chat is talking about how they're trying to make it even harder to, to be a deputy registrar. I got to tell y'all, this deputy registrar business is crazy to begin with. There's like two states, and Texas is one of them, that have that kind of foolishness at all. And then to make it even harder, there, it's, you can't, it's, I am pretty smart and I cannot find any good faith reason for why you would make already a restrictive policy even more restrictive other than you don't want people using it, other than you don't want people registering, right? And you know, and then when you add that to the fact that they're trying to make it impossible to do online voter registration or impossible to do automatic voter registration, they just don't want people who are not already registered coming in. And who is that? Those are people who are just turning 18, which in Texas is largely people of color, and people who are naturalized citizen, which in Texas is also largely people of color. Like they want a static election system because they think that that is the only way that they're going to be stay into power. And I'm sorry, it's not up to them. It's not up to them. <laughs> like they're not entitled to their job. They have to answer to us. And, um, so I think we need to be constantly reminding uh, everybody that this does not need to be this strict. I work nationwide and I can tell you it does not need to be this way. There is not more fraud or more confusion or more um, you know, cheating in other parts of the country um, that don't have these kinds of restrictive policies. So help us out with message and framing a little bit. I know when we go in there to testify and talk to them, it's election security, election integrity, safety, security frame that we're going to get washed with. And I mean, help us with countermeasures to this. Are there things they could be doing that actually could have a beneficial effect for security that don't in any way disenfranchise any actual voters? Absolutely. Um, I actually uh, wrote a report uh, called Election Security, a Pro-Voter Agenda, where we looked at different policies. Um, you know, some of the ideas are things like automatic voter registration. So what is automatic voter registration? That's a fancy name for changing the presumption as to who should register to vote. So let me tell you what I mean by that. Like when you go into the DMV office, they are required by law to ask if you want to register to vote. Under automatic voter registration, they tell you, you're going to be registered to vote unless you say, I don't want to be. You still have the opportunity to decline. You still have the opportunity to opt out. And you need to be able to have the opportunity to opt out. You have a First Amendment right to decide not to register. And people are allowed to get driver's licenses in Texas if they're not citizens, right? So we need that opt out. But 
it changes people's presumption. Instead of saying, oh, I have to do something in order to register to vote, you have to do something in order to not register to vote. It changes the norms. Um, now Senator Padilla, but when he was secretary, used to say it was it was like the difference between saying, welcome to the democracy party, and there's a door over there, you can come in if you want, right? So um, if you have automatic voter registration and you have it in all government agencies so that everybody that's interacting with the government gets automatically registered unless they are not eligible or unless they don't want to, then you don't need more people in the streets, you know, registering people to vote. So they can't be claiming that, oh my God, there are, you know, people creating fraudulent registrations by registering Mickey Mouse, because you've got people being registered at government agencies where they're already presenting whatever ID they need. They're already presenting whatever paperwork they need. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really important is that if they're concerned about security, they should be worried about like foreign cyber criminals. They should be providing more resources to harden our election system against cyber attacks. They're not doing that, right? Instead, they're trying to put barriers in front of the ballot box for ordinary people. And, um, you know, they're not getting a good deal out of this. I mean, I, I, I'm always struck by the fact that in our in our Texas photo ID case, we had evidence of hundreds of thousands of people in Texas who did not have the kind of ID that that um, that law when it was first passed required. The their own evidence, the state's own evidence, found a grand total of two people, two people who a strict photo ID law would have stopped from voting fraudulent. I, we had more people in court that day who couldn't register, who couldn't vote because of a because of the photo ID law. That is not a good deal. That is not a good use of taxpayer money. So I think being able to explain, you know, as a taxpayer, as a voter, of course I want only people who are eligible to vote voting. But this policy is not going to make us more safe. This policy is not needed. You are not showing me what you're getting done with this. Um, you know, and Texas always likes to do the look over there and then here, like, I, uh, you know, the, the idea of, oh, you know, there was some vote by mail fraud in the Valley, so we're going to pass a photo ID law. Like, the two don't cohere. They're not the same problem. You don't have the same solutions. But instead, you know, you have uh, the secretary and, I'm sorry, you have the governor and the AG talking about you know, triple digit incidences of impropriety and then saying that that justifies everything. That's not good policy making. You look at the problem, you figure out how to fix that problem and you have to be proportionate. You have to be proportionate to it. And there is no proportionality to what they're doing. And the reason there's no proportionality is because it's a lie. It is pretext. It is pretext. They want to interfere with the rights of people to vote. It's about the only conclusion you can draw sometimes. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, there's not, you know, there's not a whole lot there. The evidence isn't there. And I don't know why Texans aren't more up in arms about it. I really don't understand. They're, it's like we're being conned. It's like a con, um, you know, tons of resources, tons of misinformation. And what are we getting out of it? Like we're getting eligible people having a harder time to vote. That's what we're getting out of it. And that is not a good use of taxpayer money. So I don't know if this, this my question is gonna be, is this a, a multi-state trend? One of the trends we've kind of started to see here already in some of the bill filing is a move towards centralization, where they're trying to preempt and take things away from counties and centralize it at the Secretary of State's office. And you brought up, Cybersecurity. Uh, you know, if we had one voter roll at the Secretary of State's office and we were hacked, the whole state has an issue. If one county is hacked, well, we have a problem in that county, but we don't have a problem across the entire state. Is this a thing going on in other states? Uh, how oh, it's I funny because it's always like, it's always very self-serving, right? Like, you know, like, you know, folks want, you know, anti-voter forces want centralization when, the only power they have is at the centrality. Anti-voter forces want localization when they only have power at the localities. I think the, the best way to do this is to have the risk diversification that you're talking about, but a minimum floor, 
right? To have a minimum floor. Like everybody in the state gets this minimum level of good customer service from their election officials. And counties can do better than that if they want, right? Like, you know, um, you know, we want people to innovate. Like folks, you know, especially a place like Texas, like a group, so an organ, a state that believes in federalism because they want there to be laboratories of experiment and they want to be able to do better, should understand that devolution to the to the county level, right, or the city level. Mm -hmm. I mean, you either believe in the principle of risk diversification and of local control, or you don't. And what we're seeing is folks kind of being a little inconsistent about about what they support, depending on what helps them. So is there a state you could know offhand, maybe not, but that does this, you know, we were talking about having multiple redundancies in a system to keep something from going wrong that has this relationship between a state government and its county implementers in a way that is like the gold state, the best practice standard, if you will. Yeah, no, I mean, I tend to not talk about best practices in, in those kinds of notions. I do know that there are a number of states that share um, share policies and that you know, some things will be statewide and some things will be local and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I, I mean, I, I tend to be pretty agnostic on those kinds of systems as long as people are revisiting them and making sure, <coughs> excuse me, and making sure that voters are being, served. I mean, like that's the name of the game. Like are voters getting good customer service? Do they have a free, fair and accessible ballot? And if they do, you know, it's not like this model is always better than that model. Yeah, so you mentioned innovation, and I think this is a this is one of the really critical ones. So one of the benefits of having local elected officials is that they respond. I think the number one thing we heard in the 2020 election from our membership, uh, which is people of faith, and a lot of them are 65 plus, they were voting by mail for the first time. They had never done it before, and I, I can't even count. There was it was just dozens of of emails or hey Josh. How do I know if they got my application to vote by mail? How do I know if it was accepted or rejected? How do I know if they're going to send me a ballot? How do I know when they send me a ballot? Yeah. How do I know if they received my ballot? How do I know if it was counted or rejected? Right. Uh, you know, and that was, you know, uh, so, I mean, I wasn't the only one getting it. A couple of the local counties must have been getting peppered with this too. And so a couple of them did ballot tracking. Yep. Uh, that you know that's definitely considered a best practice it's a security measure if something is wrong somewhere you know where it was and it also can help you analyze data to figure out like where in the pipeline you're missing things so you know is the problem with the post office is the problem with a particular handler is the problem like at the back end where people don't have enough time to process them um you know these ballot marking these ballot tracking systems are 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 very appreciated in the states that have them. It is also good when folks are talking about uh, uh, whether or not to count ballots that have come in without a, uh, without a date, when someone hasn't filled in the date. In mm -hmm. many places, they'll just reject them. But if you've got the ballot tracking, you know when the voter put it in the mail, right? So, um, you know, there's a lot of good data that can come from ballot tracking. Yeah, that was one of the ones that was, I mean, it seemed to be really popular in the couple of counties that did it. Uh, and it just seems to be a, a common sense thing that would increase security because you can go back and look at what went wrong and where it went wrong and, and who it was. And it gives voters peace of mind. Like it gives voters peace of mind. So like, I mean, we're dealing with a once in a century pandemic, like, we, and people were voting by mail because they, they needed to not go into the in person. So like, why would we just make it harder for them and cause that stress right now? Like, you know, voting should be something that we're excited about, that we're proud to be doing. It shouldn't be something that's causing anxiety, right? And and I think this 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 black boxness of um, all this stuff is really is really bad for for the idea of voting, and it's really bad for encouraging people to participate. Yes, yeah, so and now we have some questions starting to come in. We seem to have stimulated the chat conversation. Yeah, the <laughs> opportunity to cure. We are, of course, one of those states that does not provide that opportunity to cure. I, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've made the argument that if you're actually after real fraud, you would want people to come cure their ballot because that's you know an extra ballot. You don't have to go investigate after the fact if that was a thing you wanted to pursue. Is that uh, help? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the reason you want to give people the opportunity to cure is because people make silly mistakes and like people are tired or something goes wrong, right? Like election work make, stake, make mistakes too. I mean, voters will, you know, forget to sign something. Voters will, um, you know, smudge something when they're when they're writing it and it's hard to, to see it but like that's not any reason to silence somebody which is effectively what you're doing when you're throwing away your mail ballot um we definitely need better cure opportunities in texas and i will say that texas um we put this chart together of how prepared people were or states were to be dealing with voting in a pandemic and you know texas didn't do very well and one of them is because they had limited vote by mail opportunities and of the vote by mail opportunities that they had, um, they weren't giving adequate cure processes. Yeah, which, so one of the ways, I mean, that would be awesome. Uh, it would help uh, with the signature verification committees. And I'm starting to see a few of those bills get filed and uh, they are uh, more restrictive, uh, not bills that would in any way help with opportunity to cure. Talk, have, have y'all seen anything nationally with these signature verification committees and 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 do they just have a have you know yeah, those are those are the reason they have not yet hit texas is because you guys are so stingy about who can do vote by mail mm. in states like georgia which up until like a minute ago were no were no excuse and anybody could vote by mail they were throwing out they were these signature verification committees were notorious for throwing out ballots and they keep getting sued seven different ways from sunday but um but you can legislate around those. Like uh, the Secretary of Michigan issued really good guidance on um, how signatures are to be counted, and like uh, you know, suggesting that there is a you know enough presumption of eligibility, right? Like unless you have a reason to believe that um, a signature is not authentic or genuine, then you assume that that the that the signature is correct i mean so many people's signature changes over time so many people's signature changes with respect to age so many people's signature changes if they have like a you know if they have a health reason if they break their arm and the like and are, are we really going to be disenfranchising voters for that there's so many other checks in the system including if you use this ballot tracking if you have good like and clean voter registration lists there's a lot of things that you can do um, that don't rely on uh, overly miserly and really hard to meet signature verification policy. So do other states, one of the things we were surprised to learn, we did a big request for rejected ballots. Uh, I guess it was in between the primary and the general. Uh, and one of the things we got surprised by was, you know, we don't actually have records from the 2016 uh, general election because state law only makes mandates that we retain them for 22 months. Is that yeah. normal or is that another just an amazing Texas thing? Well, um, federal law sets forth certain limits for federal elections. State law is different, but I have to tell you, having cast, uh, having filed a bazillion different public records requests across the state of Texas, you know, the record keeping isn't great. Like, I mean, I, I remember once we filed a public record request and somebody literally like returned the request and like wrote like the numbers by hand next to next to what we asked. We got one too, yeah, yeah. You can't get copies of them. I mean, part of it is like these, these counties are strapped and, you know, those information requests are hard, but those are things that you could also do if you were trying to make things better. Like give people a good, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, state of the art, you know, database system that keeps records for them that is easy to use and something that, you know, I mean, there's so many ways to do this better if they were actually trying to do it better. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, as I tend to be a pretty generous person and I tend to presume good faith, but like it is, it's really hard to do that in Texas because they keep getting told and they keep coming up with like same messed up stuff. Like, you know, time and time again. Oh, yeah. So we had a question come in about the issue of mass mailing. Hang on. Something is advice. It says the mass mailing of unsolicited ballots. I think it means uh, the mass mailing of, of, of applications. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I, I, right. So I, there are two very different issues, like ballots. It's much easier for reasonable people to disagree about. 
applications are a bit hard to be objected to. Like applications serve an important educative function. They remind people that an election is coming. They, um, they help uh, election administrators verify addresses because if they count bounce back, they can then be like, oh, what's going on here? Why, why did somebody move? Um, so I, I, there's a lot of really good things that come from mailing applications. Um, now, what's hard is that Texas doesn't let everybody use them. So I think, you know, um, mailing to everybody that, uh, that everybody is like, performs an important educative function, but you also just want to make sure that people understand who's eligible and Texas at the same time needs to make more people eligible. All right, so let's get real practical on what people can do. Um, you know, I know my history a little bit, uh, and I go back to the 60s, and it, you know, the civil rights movement was undergirded by people of faith, uh, and they, strategic, like, they, there were many things that could have brought about racial equity. They chose voting rights. Uh, first of all, why do you think they prioritized voting rights? Uh, and two, what should we be doing today to, to, to continue the unfinished work? You know, uh, I'm glad that we're, uh, we're having this conversation, you know, Sunday, bloody Sundays tomorrow. Um, but I think, uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the right to vote is preservative of all other rights. There, if there's anything that you care about, any agenda you have legislatively, any agenda do you have politically, you're not going to get it done if you don't have um, the ability to associate with others fairly and the ability to be able to make your voice heard. Um, I also think that in a lot of ways, voting is very cathartic because it is a tangible reminder of citizenship, like having the right to vote literally transforms you to a citizen and a stakeholder um, and part of the community of preservers that have responsibilities and rights in a country. You know, and the great civil rights historian Taylor Branch used to call the vote a little piece of nonviolence, right? It is how we resolve our political differences peacefully. And we saw at the beginning of the year exactly what happens when people don't use the vote as a way of resolving political differences. And so if we want elections to serve that function, which I think we all do, I don't think anybody but the most fringe amongst us were okay with the insurrection and the violence we saw in DC that day. Um, we need to make sure that we can trust our elections and we can't trust our elections when we know that we've been silenced, when we know that politicians have been manipulating the rules of the game so that some of us can participate and some of us can't. Like if we want the system to have integrity, it needs to include all eligible Americans. Like they're the ones who are trying to carve out the electorate are the ones damaging the integrity of the system. They're the ones damaging our security. And I think it's really important we remind them of that. 